Okay, so um, welcome to the first webinar in a three-part webinar series um, that is going to um, lead up to an in-person uh, conference in Rapid City, South Dakota in um, April of this year. Um, thank you so much for joining. My name is Annie Brokenleg and I'm a state uh, diversion and JDAI coordinator in South Dakota. Um, I'm going to say it again, make the announcement again. Please keep yourself on mute if you are not presenting. Um, and please turn your camera off. So I see a Giovanni, um, if you can turn your camera off, please. And um, turn your layout to hide participants with video off. And you can do that in the right up upper corner of your screen so that you are just highlighted, um, have the youth highlighted when they start talking. So um, those are the um, housekeeping questions. Um, I'm going to introduce my colleague and neighbor to the South, Michelle Luters. But before I do that, we're going to launch a poll question. We want to hear from you guys about what your role is in the juvenile justice uh, system. So take it away, Michelle. All righty. Thank you, Annie. So as that poll comes up, we'll have you guys quickly answer that poll question, and that'll kind of give us an idea who we have with us today. Like Annie said, my name is Michelle Luters. I am her counterpart here in Nebraska. I am the state JDAI coordinator, so the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative here in Nebraska. I also uh, work for the Administrative Office of the Courts and Probation, so I support our juvenile intake and probation officers statewide with the work they do, and I'm really excited to have you all here. And I see the poll question is there in the uh, chat area section. So if everyone could just take a quick second to answer that question, that would be great. And we're really excited today um, to have everyone be a part of this um, web series. Annie is going to introduce our um, panel today and our youth advocate that is going to um, lead us through our discussion today. So Annie. All right. Uh, so you guys are here today to hear from the youth, and you will. This webinar will be youth-led. Um, so youth justice from a youth perspective, right? Um, so you're going to hear from youth that have uh, that lived experience in the juvenile justice system. But why is it important for us to incorporate their voice into our work as professionals? So think about that today. Think about how you might be able to start um, using youth voice in your own work. Um, well, why do we? Why is that important? It helps us to make better decisions when it comes to policy, case management, and ultimately better outcomes. In addition, it's also super empowering for youth to have a voice at the table. It gives them a chance to give back while hopefully changing the trajectory of other kids that enter the system. So leading our panel today is Asia Marie Ross. Um, Asia is a youth justice advocate and creative out of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, as a youth justice advocate, Asia Marie focuses on uh, things like ending youth incarceration with community alternatives, probation transformation. She works at um, law enforcement reform and community um, engagement. Uh, she currently sits on the Minnesota State Advisory Group. I had the privilege of meeting Asia when she led a national youth panel as she's an alum of the Annie E. Casey Foundation Youth Advisory Council. I know you're going to be in good hands with Asia leading, leading this panel, so I'm going to turn it over to her. But before I do, um, it looks like we've got um, our youth highlighted here. So um, I'm going to ask all the youth that we have. So we've got Dessa, Keegan, uh, Stanford, Denise, um, on our youth panel. So make sure you guys turn your cameras on. Everyone else that is not on this panel, please turn your cameras off and mute yourselves so that the youth, this really is youth led. Um, that's our ask. So Asia, take it away. Okay. Wonderful. I hope you all can hear me well. Thank you, Annie, for having me in for the introduction. Um, so good afternoon, when I started this, um, like Annie said, my name is Asia Marie and I'm going to be, um, uh, moderating this discussion. Um, the focus is, uh, hearing what youth justice looks like from a youth perspective. Uh, unfortunately here in Mexico, uh, Wi-Fi is terrible. So I'm getting a bit of a lag, uh, as far as pictures. So when I ask a question, uh, the participants, the, uh, youth who are, going to be involved in this discussion if you just want to um, answer them as they come because I can't quite see who's um, you know going to be ready to, to talk because of uh, the lag. So with that being said, I want to open up the first question um, 
just being transparent in this discussion um, and getting right into it, what is your definition of youth justice? And when I say that, I want to know what does justice look like for those who may have been been harmed um, and justice for you as you've been integrated into the system. So what is your definition of youth justice? Um, my name's Keegan, if I can speak up for this one. Um, my definition of youth justice I'm um, looking at the philosophy behind it is um, through a rehabilitative uh, lens. Um, our youth are involved in the system and they might not be making the best choices at the time, but those choices do not define their life. But on the flip side, you also have to look that look at the idea that even though they're making bad choices and even though that they have made a mistake they and they have room to improve, they should also be held accountable and that um, just because you hurt someone and you have room to grow doesn't mean that person's still not hurt. I think it's a balancing act between um, restorative rehabilitation and um, also holding our, our youth accountable. Wonderful. Thank you, Keegan. Anyone else? To me, um, youth justice is um, allowing kids that have made mistakes are in a hard hard part in their life, giving them kind of the tools they need and the resources they need to be able to make better decisions next time and be able to evolve and work past the issues they've experienced or overcome the trauma they're going through, but helping, you know, them gain the skills they need to kind of be successful going forward in life. Excellent. Thank you for that. Does anyone else want to chime in? Okay, I'll move on to the second question. So thinking back to your first day uh, becoming system involved, what was going through your mind? What were your thoughts and emotions? And what were the thoughts of emotions of those close to you, family and friends? So um, for me, I was super young. I was about 12 or 13 years old. So the experience itself, you know, was it was scary. Um, You know, it was something like I never really feared. And so when I went to detention center, I think I was 13. When I went to detention center, it was kind of, you know, it was everything was shocking. You know, it was a different environment. It was like a whole different life. And so in a way, it um, was kind of traumatizing. And so for my family to kind of have to go through the you know process of having you know their son incarcerated for the time being was kind of like um a big it was kind of a big blow to everybody and so kind of working as a family and you know staying together and kind of working through those issues but overall it was a kind of a you know a hard point in life thank you for sharing that does anyone else want to share This is Denise, and I would agree with that statement um, as far as trauma. I feel as though um, I do believe it was necessary in my case, and I was also um, pretty young with my first involvement. You know, I was seven, but um, the biggest thing for me is I just, I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't have a lot of people um, really reaching out to me to try to determine, um, you know, what was going to happen ongoing. It was a lot of darkness for me. You know, I I knew I was getting uh, placed with people I didn't know. I didn't know what it was going to look like in the future. Um, I did feel support at that time. You know, a lot of people were really understanding with the situation, but I I feel like I just needed that clarity piece. Um, and the same goes with my family as well. Um, you know, I feel like my my family obviously was hurt. You know, it's a hard situation. Um, however, you know, it's just we needed to to be able to talk to somebody to to kind of work through those emotions. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add? Um, I can add my piece. Uh, I actually was involved in the system a little later. Uh, 15 or 16 um, in that area. So my biggest thing is I think that was the first time I experienced my own social isolation where all my friends who were involved in the same stuff I was 
I had to distance from them. And then my parents were just very upset because they didn't know about what was going on in my life prior to this. So I ended up naturally distancing from them just because as a, as a teenager, you don't want to listen to anybody tell you what you're doing wrong. So it kind of turns into it's a me against them philosophy. And what I learned is at first it was very like I felt alone. But as I went through the process and being able to admit where I was wrong and being able to figure out what got me there, it was kind of a hit ground zero and have nothing else to do but rebuild from there. So, Yeah, thank you all for sharing. Does anyone else want to go? I think um, we have one more participant. I'm not mistaken. Only if you want to share. Um, what was the question? I'm sorry, I had like a conflict with my phone, so I didn't hear it. No, no worries, no worries. Uh, the question is, thinking back to your first day becoming system involved, what was going through your mind? Uh, what were your thoughts and emotions? What were the thoughts and emotions of the people next to you, like family and friends? Um, well, I answered the system. Wait, are we talking about DSS, correct? Uh, is that detention? There's different acronyms. I'm from Minnesota, so I don't know if that's de detention in in your state. So it can it can be system involvement, wide range. It can be from court dates to um, going to detention or shelters. Uh, whatever you whatever comes to mind when you hear the question. Um. Okay. So yeah, I was 13 when I got admitted into a group home treated for kids with um bad behavior and that just basically needed help with like you know drug abuse and all of this and that and it was scary because when i entered it like i was the only young girl there like i was not even 13 i was 11 at that and it was a hard it was hard you know i didn't know what what i was doing you know like i didn't know what to do and while I was in there, my mom passed away, so that made shit, um, that made stuff 10 times harder for me. And they they don't really help you. They, honestly, they don't, like, what I was in, they didn't help me. Um, they didn't try to talk to me about, you know, why I was doing what I was doing. And they just, you know, sit us down, give us packets about, you know, marijuana, Stuff like that, you know. Yeah, it's but, not really meaningful. That's all I gotta say. Yeah, thank you, thank you all for sharing. And I also do want to say, like, if you if if a swear word comes out and you feel like that's how you have to express yourself to give a full context to your experience, then this is a space to do that. This is a space where um, we want all of the emotions of which you experience to be laid out on the table as long as you're comfortable so that the system professionals can feel that and understand that and make change based off of that and based off of our experiences. So I just want to put that out there. Um, so thank you all for sharing that. Um, the next question is, in your experience, what was missed? What should have been done better? And actually, if it's okay, Dessa, I'd like to start with you for this question. What was missed and what could have been done, what should have been done better? What could have done better was where, like, they can at least sit down and talk to you about your feelings or if you want to talk about anything, but no, it was like, you know, you can go back to your room, you can go to bed, you can go talk to all these other kids, like, no, like, what if I want to talk to an adult who knows things, who, who's who been through things? Like, that's what they could do better is talk to you, get your point of the view, and know exactly what you've been through. They don't want to, like, you know, not judge us, but, like, you know, say something off, off, the, off the hook about something that they don't even know about you. Maybe if it's true, what if it's true? Like, you know, like, what if they make fun of, like, a situation we've been through? Like, that shit happened to me, and it's, like, not even funny because I see them still having their moms around, their dads, while I'm, like, 11, not having, not having shit, but being in the group home, the youngest kid, like, what could have done, been done better is, like, if they, you know, would have sat me down and told me, oh, what is this place? What is this going to help me with? How long am I going to be in here for? 
what do I have to do to even get out of this, like, this place? Like, it was a prison, honestly. Like, not a prison, but it was, like, a group home, but a very, very structured, high group home. That's what they could have done better. Desta, can I, can I ask, you mentioned that your mom passed while you were confined. Did you have any type of support through that, any type of um, healing uh, resources through that? Anyone to talk to through that? Um, honestly, I was in that group home with my sister, and um, she didn't care. Honestly, she didn't even give a fuck about what happened to my mom. You know, but I did. Feeling at age at 11, knowing you're not going to have a mom when you only get one. Like, they didn't help me. I was the one who went back into the girls' wing by myself, cried myself to sleep. There, There's no resources. Like, they'll tell you, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'm here if you need anything. When it really comes down to something that if you really need something or need somebody to talk to, they they don't have the right words. They don't have enough knowledge to know. I don't know. It was just hard. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you for sharing. But yeah, it sounds like you weren't given the opportunity to like, to have support and men from that. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that. Um, but thank you for sharing. Does anyone else want to um, chime in on the question of the in your experience, what was missed and what should have been done better? I feel, this is Denise again, and I feel as though in my system, um, the biggest thing that, that really impacted me growing up was I was in 22 placements um, in a very short amount of time within four to five years. Um, so related to that question, I feel like what was missed was the opportunity for me to genuinely have a home and to make connections within my community. Um, I was constantly worried about where I was going to move next. Um, I didn't really try to make friends or you know have any kind of support because i knew um that every place that i i would continue to go would be you know I, it would be brief um along with that i feel like you know since i was in the system for such a long time you know it's about 11 years in total um the biggest thing for me as well is you know i became a teen mom at 17 while I was um, on probation and I feel as though they were supportive and understanding in the fact that you know they they gave me encouragement that I could do it however I feel the resources were really lacking um, they always talked about all these things they could offer me but I didn't really understand the avenues to go about um, you know getting into a house that they would be able to help um, me budget or you know to be successful um, and I kind of feel I was pushed out of the system system uh, prematurely you know I was in the system for a very long time but then I once I became pregnant and I graduated um, they I was kicked off um, the system about six months prior to my 19th birthday so um, you know and in, in my state in Nebraska 19 um, is the age of adulthood so I feel like you know, I miss a lot of resources that I could have taken advantage of if I had aged out of the system. Um, and then, you know, just the resources that I believe were available and some people, um, you know, exercise, I just feel like it wasn't talked about enough. Um, you know, I, I later found out there's teen mops and, you know, there's just a lot of groups that um, want to see you succeed in, in my situation. Thanks so much for that, Denise. Does anyone else want to try that? Um, I would say kind of like both Dessa and Denise said, for me, um, it was kind of the lack of resources. So when I went through my sis uh, my situation, I was placed on probation and I felt like my time on probation, it was kind of spent with um, just kind of it was they they I just kind of breezed through it. I didn't get the resources for, you know, the anger management, the therapy services that I should have got, kind of those things that really could have put more tools in my toolbox. I said I think I was felt limited uh to that. But thankfully for myself and kind of where I knew I wanted to go and where I didn't want to go, which was back to jail, I kinda of took it upon myself to kinda of, uh push myself, which I you know, I should have pushed myself to 
want to be better and want to do better. So for me, I was thankful that I was able to get out of the system and continue to make good choices and not be a, um, a reoffender. But for the other people in my situation, not all could be able to do that. Not all could have that motivation. And so, you know, when the system's kind of having uh, people in place that are supposed to be your supports and help you get those tools and they're lacking the effort of doing that, it kind of, you know, kind of sets other kids that need more help up for failure without giving them all those resources. So I think, you know, kind of lacking, giving out, you know, resources to not only the the kid, but to the families and how they can also help their kid during that situation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And what, what sounds like in a nutshell, like the consistent theme is like oftentimes that, you know, if an offense occurs or harm has been done, um, the system responds for accountability being us to be isolated, us to just be locked away, time spent, you know, but there's no development happening for us. There's, there's no resources given to us so that we can learn how to develop ourselves to make better decisions, to be better human beings as we're still developing, as teenagers, as children, as we're still developing, we're just kind of put away and tucked to the side and just, just, just sitting there in isolation is supposed to be enough. It's supposed to be the lesson, but really uh, it takes resources, it takes support, it takes learning our strengths so that we can go that way and, and, and utilize our strengths and to make better decisions and be an asset in our communities instead of just uh, the usual response, just, just being sent away or entered into the system that's not really giving us these tools, right, like Stanford said, to make better decisions. Um, so thank you, everyone, for chiming in. Uh, the next question is going to be, uh, give an example where a system professional or uh, a professional in any institution uh, met you where you were currently at uh, and actively listened to the things that you had to say and gave solutions and support thereafter. So, and I can repeat it too, because I feel like it kind of was a lot. So give an example of a time where assistant professional or institution professional met you where you were at, actively listened to you and gave you solutions and support. This is Denise again. And um, a situation that just came to my mind when hearing that, um, you know, going back to being the teen mom, um, my my previous probation officer as a juvenile actually took me to my appointment um, that confirmed it. Um, she was very supportive through the process and she, she actually confined in me, um, you know, about a little bit about her family. And I felt really understood and I felt like I was going to be able to be successful because I knew other people people had, you know, previously gone through that. Um, and, you know, just in general, I feel like she was very understanding and empathetic with my situation, um, you know, and she she shared that she had family members that grew up in the system. And I know that that's not common, that they really try to have it so that you remain professional and you, you know, but I will tell you those experiences and just those little side talks helped me, you um, to be successful, you know, later on. Yes, thank you. Does anyone else want to give an example of where a system professional um, met you where you were at? Um, for me, um, I was able to get help from um, a person in the community and he actually helped me get in a program that was designed for at-risk youth and so within that program I was able to get a job working at um, a community center here in Lincoln and so that opportunity um, it was about seven years ago the opportunity happened and since then I you know took over as the youth uh, the youth director of team programming at that community center and so since you know he allowed me that opportunity I was able to grow and that has ultimately changed the trajectory of my life and where I ended up. So without him and, you know, his support, getting that job and helping me get that resource, um, I probably wouldn't be sitting here on this youth panel with you guys right now. Thank you for that, Stanford. Yeah, it just reiterates the importance of, of support and opportunities given, really. Need something else to do, more support, more activity. Does anyone else want to share? Mm 
Okay, if not, I will move on to the next question. Who were the people you trusted and relied upon and how did they support your success? Um, so when I got that job at the community center and I started working there, the director was probably um, one of my biggest supports. And, you know, he was also an African-American male and African-American man. And so kind of in how I grew up, I didn't see really many African-American men in those positions. So with him being one and giving me the opportunity and kind of helping coach me up and, you know, that was kind of my biggest support to being there and being able to impact the kids I learned was something not only I was good at, but something I look forward to and I wanted to do. And so through that, you know, I made a career out of it. That became, you know, my support to going um, to that center every day, working with the kids, helping with homework, playing basketball was kind of the biggest support I needed to make the change in me that I wanted to make. Thank you, Stanford. And I do want to say with that too, that just kind of also highlights the importance of, representation, right? Like anyone can help, anyone can support, but representation does matter, right? When we see people who look like us, who act like us, who we see ourselves in them, in these positions that we've never seen people in that look like us before, it makes a difference. And like Stanford said, it changes the trajectory. So that's why representation is important. One of the many reasons that representation is important. Um, does anyone else want to chime in on who were the people you trusted and relied upon and how did they support your success? I would definitely say um, through my system involvement, I I had kept one CASA worker um, and I still speak to her to this day. Um, she was one of the few people in my circle I felt like I could trust. Um, you know, I, I knew her intentions. I knew that she wanted to help. Um, and, you know, I just genuinely believe that, you know, first of all, you know, I, I started doing advocacy because of people like that in my life. Um, you know, I just think she's an amazing woman and watching her continuously show up for me created that element of trust. Um, and it also wanted me to be better and I, I wanted to be like her. And I, I just think that's pretty great. Thank you. Keegan, Dessa, do you all want to chime in on uh, the people that you trusted and relied upon and how they supported you? Um, speaking from my standpoint, I went through a diversion program and the whole situation kind of seemed very, it was helpful in the extent that it was a, it was a literal second chance before moving on to a more serious consequence. But I don't think I actually received any in my opinion, had any like major figures of people who I relied upon and trusted wholeheartedly um, until I was done with the initial program and I was no longer considered like a delinquent. Um, whereas afterwards, at least in my state, once you're done with your di diversion program, you're basically on a probationary period for the next year or two. Um, and if you can stay law, law abiding during that, um, then you're, you're, um, your charges kind of get, they get flushed away. Um, it was during that part, portion where I was out of the program, but I was still allowed to volunteer where um, our team court advisor, her and I got really close and I ended up um, moving through their system and helping out being um, the president of their advisory board, taking mentors under my wing, kind of helping them how I saw it because going through the process was very lonely by itself. Um, and you kind of had to figure out for yourself how to do it, um, which also brings me to the part, you know, back to that last question of, I think we really need to focus on what can we do right then and there. You don't want your, your clients, you know, falling into that self-fulfilling prophecy of you're a delinquent. So you're kind of stuck there. Um, I was, I was lucky to know that I had no choice. I mean, I had a choice. It was either do what I was going to do and, you know, end up never getting out of my hometown, never getting out of the system, or I was going to just kind of prevail. So, yeah, I, I think my advisor was – my second advisor, because we went through two or three of them while I was there. Um, she was she was a big help staying out of out of the, uh, the environment that got me there to begin with after the process was over. 
Thank you so much. Dessa, did you want to share on that question? Yes. Who are the people you trusted and relied upon? Okay, wonderful. Okay. So, like, through my time, like, I did, I was able to have, like, one phone call a week for 15 minutes. And the only person I would ever call was, like, my auntie mom. She's my auntie, but I call her mom just because, like, she's my mom, you know? Like, she's been there for me. And she was my emotional support and just everything in general because, um, you know, she knew what to say. She knew she was wise, and she is wise. And... It was just a big help to me because at a young age like that, like I never thought I was like going to live a life like this or anything. But yeah, my auntie mom was, my auntie mom is my everything. She helped me out through a lot while being in that group home and then anywhere else. Okay. Thank you so much, Dessa. Um, so for the people who are listening, uh, I want you all to imagine what you would feel like if you only could contact one loved one, one time a week for 15 minutes. And as you think about that, please put in the chat, the word that comes to mind when you think about that, what emotion do you feel when you think about only having one phone call a week for 15 minutes to the person that you love? So moving on, um, Dessa, Keegan, Denise, Stanford, I hope you all can chime in on this one. What are your strengths? What are your goals? Um, some of my strengths, I would say, are being kind of being relatable to the to the people I'm working with. I try to be as knowledgeable about, you know, things that the youth are doing and actively doing so that way I can relate better. And some of my weaknesses is kind of challenging myself every day to do do more than what I'm doing. So kind of got comfortable with working in my community center and just kind of doing the day to day. So now I've been kind of stepping out of my comfort zone, challenge myself to do more things like these panels and more things where I can just get out and kind of be more of um, a spokesperson for kind of what kids could possibly be going through that um, can identify with my situation. Dessa, Keegan, Denise, strengths and goals. Um, I would think. Denise, go right ahead, and then Dessa. Okay, I would say one of my biggest strengths um, would be resilience um, and just being accustomed and having the ability to change um, direction. Uh, one of my biggest goals is, you know, actually what I'm doing now. I wanted to do advocacy, and I, I wanted to share my experience and my strengths with other people, but I also wanted to understand um, you know, more about what happens behind the scenes. And I feel like I get a really good um, experience with that, doing things like this and just speaking to other youth in my community. Thank you. Dessa? Um, so my strength is, honestly, I ain't even going to lie. It's, you know, just being humble because out of every situation I've been through, I never complained why. Why am I going through this when there's a billion kids out here going through worship, not eating every day? So I just stayed humble and I I think I don't know if that's a strength or not, but I, I say it's a strength. Absolutely, I think it is. Can I ask what are your goals? Um my goals are to provide for myself and my baby. Um because i mean i am pregnant now like i legit found out like two weeks ago but you know like my goals are just to accomplish and be a person to where i can share my story to other youth and to help them in any way possible 
to not let them go through what I've been through or what you guys been through too, because it is something that nobody should have to go through. Okay. Thank you, Dessa. Uh, and Keegan, did you have anything to add? What are your strengths? What are your goals? Yes, I did. I just didn't want to be stuck in the awkward, like all three of us try to talk at once. So I figured I'd just wait. Um, right on. Anyways, um, my strength, I think, would be a combination of um, I'm very I'm very personable and I'm very um, willing to go out and ask questions. I'm not scared to admit failure and to take criticism. So I think this my process in the system actually helped with that. Um, actually, being able to put myself in uncomfortable positions to to learn from it um, since my involvement and even before then uh, I do have family members that have gone through the system as well. And then I have a lot of, a lot of addiction in my family and all of this combined has kind of brought me to my path of um, I've been pursuing a degree in psychology and have been applying for doctorate programs for the past, like six months, probably trying to figure out what I can do with the main goal of trying to uh, figure out whether I'm in like the justice system or if I'm in the, uh, in the, more um, psychology rehabilitative system, where can I help people either the beginning when they're young and they are have a whole life ahead of them or towards the end where they feel like they're kind of trapped? How can I, how can I be that person to help um, an individual wherever they're struggling? Um, that's kind of been my goal. We're still pursuing it, but we got years ahead of us. So. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, you all are an asset to this world. Um, you know, we need you. I need you. And I have no doubt that you all will accomplish all of the things that you hope to. So you have my support. Uh, so with that question, do you feel like your strengths and your goals were uplifted and supported while system involved? So this is kind of a two part question, right? So there's that where your system or excuse me, where your strengths and goals uplifted and supported while you were system involved. And also, uh, could or were your strengths and goals used as an opportunity to develop and even segue out of the system? So thinking like a, a, con a constructive probation condition, right? Like I have to, um, you know, talk to five other youth and um, tell them, just tell them, share my story with a youth as one of my conditions uh, to getting off of probation. So were they used in that way? Uh, and if they weren't, how could they have been? And do you feel like your strengths and goals were uplifted and supported while you were system involved? Um, I'll just I'll just chime in real quick. Um, my uh, I, I think I think while in the system, I kind of figured out a way to use my strengths. Um, uh, very early on, um, I kind of relied on myself to get through it's not a whole lot of fun sitting through hours and hours and hours of uh diversion programs because that's one of the one of the um one of the pieces of uh our south dakota diversion programs you have to sit through other people's and um i found out i, I was able to use my personal ability and my um questions to gain enough information to eventually mentor a handful of students that with or without me, who knows? I'm not saying that I'm the reason they made it through the program, but I mean, I saw a lot of people fail and I was able to at least try to help people not fail that were going through the same program as myself. So that's kind of how I use my strengths at least. Thank you. Anyone else? Were your strengths and goals uplifted and supported while you were just involved? Um, could or were they used as a way to uh, develop or segue out of the system. Um, for me personally, I was placed on probation kind of as the sentencing for my situation. And while on probation, um, I met with my probation officer the week before I got discharged. So that was our first time actually meeting each other and having any type of dialogue with each other. And um, before that, it was one other conversation to set up that date to discharge but um i don't feel like probation or
atmosphere and environment I move myself to with, you know, finding a job and being, you know, more active in the community kind of pushed me to get to those goals and to execute some of them and are still uh, working to get to them. Thank you. Does anyone else want to share? I would say it definitely depended on um, what those goals were. I got a lot of help, um, you know, in applying for grants and, and all of that. Um, however, you know, younger on, I, I wanted to do a lot of volunteering in the community. And I kind of had to utilize my own resources. Um, and, you know, a lot like what Keegan was saying, I, I was really self-dependent. And I believe that being a part of the system had really helped in that. Um, but I, you know, I found those avenues to to meet people um, and to just kind of get out of of my head for a little while and do something productive. Thank you. Does anyone else want to share? If not, I think, and too, I'll share a little bit on this particular question. Um, uh, is that when I was on probation, and, and it, it's interesting to hear Stan, Stanford's point of view in saying um, that probation may not be like it. Sh well, honestly, it kind of shouldn't be like the avenue where our our strengths and goals are developed. That should be something that comes um, before probation. But while on probation, you know, it it, it can't. It should be, but we sh it shouldn't even. The discussion that we should be developing our goals on probation shouldn't even be a topic of discussion, in my opinion. Um, all of that should come post-probation. But if we are on probation, um, our strengths should be highlighted rather than um, what people may see as a deficit. But when I was on probation, um, I was actually introduced to art on probation, and I still have a lot of the pieces that I created. And um, being introduced to art um on probation as well as yoga um today i'm a yoga instructor and i quit my job in september to create full time so um it it kind of speaks to it it is a large opportunity to like i said change the traje trajectory and to develop strengths and assets so that we can put those into the world instead of our our what people may see as our deficit being um, focus upon. So thank you everybody for adding to that. Um, I apologize if my mic is giving feedback as well, but moving on to the next question. And this is well, I'd like to hear from everyone. What are your ideas for creating a better and holistic youth justice system? Um, from my perspective, I think a better youth justice system would be more, more individualized to an extent, not so cookie cutter for every individual that comes in. Um, yeah, three kids with the same charges might have three different ways they've got there and completely different aspects of why they're there. So I think, I think actually taking it and using it as like a, a case study for person in a way is uh, would be a lot more beneficial and i think that with with that would come more um the rehabilitative side and um that would follow as well along with if we use the time that we had to get to know our individual our, our youth and get to know why they're there more motivational interviewing can go on along with um more i guess better in-depth goal setting as well i think you'd see a lot of a lot less or a lot lower recidivism rate if we if we individualized each of our cases here. Thank you, Keegan. Does anyone else want to add? What are your ideas for creating a better holistic youth justice system? Um, for me, it'd be kids having the opportunity to um, learn more about themselves because, you know, sometimes they go through the system, they're put in kind of could be the hardest spot of their life or one of the scariest parts. So, you know, kind of 
helping them feel comfortable kind of learning more about themselves. What are their interests? What can they do and where they can go from there and making sure that kids are getting the help they need and the support they need in order to overturn where they're at and um, get on the, the right path to be successful in the end. Denise, Dessa, what are your ideas for creating a better holistic youth justice system? Um, um, the person before me, that's exactly what he... Oh, but it's like more personal. It's more personal in a lot of ways. And it just helps a significant other, like, oh, uh, I don't know. Or not a significant other, but each person, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, the person before me, exactly what he said, because that is a good idea. I'm not sure if it's me, but I'm having a hard time hearing you. It's kind of going in and out. I wouldn't be surprised if it's me. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. Okay, so what I was saying, the person before me that spoke, oh, I'm just, you know, that's just, that's a good idea. You know? Like, he basically took the words out of my mouth. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Dessa. Denise, did you have anything you wanted to add? Is there any way you can repeat the question? I had to log off and log, uh, log back on because of uh, I wasn't able to hear anybody. Yeah, no worries. Uh, what are your ideas for creating a better holistic youth justice system? Um, you know, just to kind of piggyback on what I was saying earlier, I just think that, um, you know, having the resources available, um, and then also, I would say just that genuine communication and conversation. Um, I feel like, you know, growing up, I a lot of things were told to me on how I needed to be and what I needed to focus on. But I feel like if we focus on the youth and their wants and needs, um, I, I feel like we, we create a, a different and, you know, a, a better experience for them individually. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for chiming in on that. Uh, we got two more questions to go, and the next one is, what does healthy accountability look like? Now, I just want to elaborate a little bit. So what does healthy accountability look like for us who may have caused harm? Um, and even, right, because self-love is something that we're all entitled to. So what does that look like for healthy accountability look like for, for those we may have harmed? But also if we've harmed ourselves, right, harmed ourselves of opportunities physically, emotionally, um, how do we account for that and mend for that? But also uh, what is healthy accountability to the systems and institutions who may have caused farther harm to us look like as well? So I know that was kind of a lot and we can go around multiple times answering each portion of that. But what does healthy accountability look like for you, the, the next person? and for these systems and institutions that may have caused more harm. Um, from my perspective, uh, looking at healthy accountability for yourself, um, I believe it's understanding what you might have done is wrong, whether you believe it's not, or it is, you know, it's, it's, it's against the law, it's against the law. How can you get past that? I think the biggest part is being able to say, okay, accept it and doing what it takes to not only help the individuals you may have caused harm to, but to forgive yourself as well and move past and be able to be a better person out of it rather than to dwell on it and keep making the same mistakes. 
Um, for me, um, healthy accountability for, uh, like as a juvenile would be kind of ha being open, being honest, having conversation with me. And, you know, if you're my support, it's being a support that can build a good relationship where they can correct my mistakes and help me build and become better, but also still making sure that, you know, that they are um, giving me the feeling that they do care and they do want to help me get to where I'm going. So to kind of, you know, hold me accountable and help me through my mistakes, but also not to kind of get too upset and to not make me feel like they don't care. Cause then it's hard for me to accept that accountability and understand the accountability. So you don't feel like you're cared and supported about. Excellent. Thank you. Denise or Dessa, do you want to chime in as to what healthy accountability looks like? What was the question? So what does healthy accountability look like? So when holding ourselves accountable in a healthy way um, for ourselves, for the people that we may have harmed, and also for the systems and institutions who may have caused more harm to us. Um, so like, um, do you mean for like myself? Yes. Okay. Um, Healthy accountability to me, like what I like for me, like, uh, I don't know, taking responsibility of your actions and your mistakes and by learning by them and learning as you grow. So, like, you know, if you have kids in the future, they won't ever go through this. That's like healthy accountability to me is. Um, yeah. <laughs> Asia, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, so just being mindful of time, um, I do kind of want us to dive a little bit deeper into um, the question of what does health, like how do we hold um, these systems and institutions um, accountable in um, an effective way if they have caused more harm? So like, for example, I can think of countless times that I have been suspended from high school for situations that I, I shouldn't have been suspended for, period. So how, how would I because I've never done it, right? So how could I go about, you know, um, holding accountable um, my high school that failed me, you know, that, that principal that, that constantly uh, suspended me? You know, what does that conversation look like and what things can be implemented so that that's not always the case? We're not so quick to suspend, but rather we can have a conversation or we can have um, a, a restorative circle. Uh, so I just want you all to think about that a little bit. Uh, what, what does healthy accountability look like for us holding systems and institutions um, accountable? So what you're basically saying is what I said was wrong than what you asked? No, no, there was, there was many different breakdowns that I had to the question. So it was, it was healthy accountability for ourselves. It was healthy accountability for the people that we have harmed, but also healthy accountability for the system and institutions that may have caused more harm. So it was kind of like a three-part question. So okay. you answered, yeah, you answered, you answered correctly. So Thank does anyone, does anyone want to um, chime in on that? And personally, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from, and I hope it's okay, I'd be interested to hear from Denise, just because you mentioned that you had been in 22 different placements, right? And, and to some degree, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, it, it does seem like um, the system has, did fail at some point. So I'm wondering, what do you feel like healthy accountability could have looked like for that system? What could have been put in place so that you 
wouldn't have been failed by the system, if that makes sense. Um, I just think, I mean, you know, and, and for both, for me, it was more acceptance. Um, for uh, the avenue of the, the placements, um, I feel like just having, I mean, this is honestly still hard for me, just to be quite frank with you. Um, you know, I feel like I, I kind of let a lot of it go and tried to move on. Um, but for me, doing what I'm doing now and speaking up for people who may be um, not accustomed to doing so or, you know, scared of um, any kind of retaliation, um, I think that that's extremely important. Um, you know, I had a lot of conversations with a lot of people in, in my hometown. Um, I was in YRTC here in Nebraska twice. Well, um, the conditions that I was in were, were very poor. I spoke to, you know, my cost worker, um, a lot of my caseworkers and stuff about that. Um, unfortunately, they just did something about it um, about a year or two ago. But I believe that because so many of us spoke up um, and held them accountable in that aspect, they finally had to take a look at it um, and to pursue other options um, to make sure that the girls there were successful. Oh, you're muted again, I think. <laughs> I'll mute you. No. Asia, you're muted. Well, while while Asia is figuring out sound, I'm so sorry, Asia. Because <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look like you're muted, but having some technical problems. We are right at 1 p.m. Um, so I wanted to say thank you so much to the youth and to Asia for leading this conversation. I think. You've just got this natural leadership ability, Asia, um, to really um, to get these kind of responses from kids. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to turn it over to Michelle because I know she was kind of going to be the closer for the webinar. Um, and again, just thank you guys so much. Again, if you guys have questions in the chat, we'll get it to the youth panelists. Um, I know I've got some questions. So thank you for a great conversation. And um, Michelle, you can just kind of wrap, wrap us up. Perfect. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, words can't say enough. I'm just watching the comments that have been coming in. So much gratitude to the youth that participated today. We so appreciate um, the honest feedback. It is something that I think we all want to strive to do better um, for the young people that we work with. So thank you so much. Like Annie said, there are a couple of questions that we may try to um, get some feedback from um, all of our panelists on to um, share out in some future forums that we have um, moving forward. Um, so um, in addition to thanking um, the youth in Asia, again, thank you so much. I wanna thank uh, the Court Improvement Project here in Nebraska for helping the, set up the platform and helping organize us to make this possible. We had a great amount of participation. We're so very thankful for everyone who joined us. We do have another webinar series coming up February 25th. Uh, so next month, 12 o'clock Central Standard Time, we'll be um, listening to um, Terry Liggins and Eric uh, Bringswythe, who will be talking about engaging with community partners to achieve meaningful outcomes. So those are some community partners uh, from South Dakota that will be doing a presentation um, for us here in February, and then in March, we will have one final um, presentation talking about um, role alternatives to detention. So again, we cannot thank everyone enough. We hope you have a great afternoon, and um, we look forward to seeing you all in February. So um, let's just try to get this last question out here. I know that we're recorded too, so that people can um, come back later if they choose to. So final question is, what should system professionals keep in mind in their own work 
And also when engaging youth to have these kind of discussions and relive their past. So Keegan, I think you're the only one left from our panel. I think everyone else popped off. Oh, that is all right. Um, I think my biggest thing, um, being that I, I do actually sit on uh, the Council of Juvenile Services for South Dakota, um, when looking at integrating youth into the conversation, I think that the biggest, the biggest thing is knowing that you know they might not speak up, they might feel intimidated by being the youngest person in the room with the least amount of credentials. Um, but they do have some perspective and at some level that perspective can be very helpful. Um, I think that allowing them to express maybe the flaws that they see it, maybe not. I mean, there's a specific, there's a very specific uh, group of people you'll find in, in panels like this, at least. I mean, these are the people that actually came above adversity um, rather than sticking sticking through and doing the same thing. So we must have figured something out along the way. I think knowing that they do have something to say, even though they might not have all the fancy degrees and life experiences that all of our great professionals have, I think that's important to take that into consideration. Thank you. And I guess I, I, I suppose I, I can speak on this question too, uh, since our participants, a couple of our participants left. So, um, but thinking about what system professionals should keep in mind when engaging youth to have these discussions and reliving their past is, um, you know, like all of the participants said, Dessa Keegan, Denise, and Stanford, is that there was so much trauma that takes place in and being system involved, being in detention, and also in that time period that could have been happening in our personal lives and trauma in, in that time. And so to be brought and to have these conversations about them and relive them, uh, I think that system professionals have to be very mindful with the questions they ask, um, even incorporating youth into the questions that are going to be asked um, when having these types of discussions. Uh, and I think the biggest thing for um, system professionals just in their day-to-day -day work is to 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 keep their keep a portion of their um, right like system professional hardware but also I think that has to be in balance with their 15 16 year old self and I think the combination of the two will make for a more efficient and healthy uh, system as well so yeah that's that's all I have hey. Thank you, Asia. I know that was, um, I'm, I'm glad for the people that got to stay on and hear the bonus question, because I think that's a, a really important piece is like, what, what should we be considerate of when we're asking youth to come to the table, you know, that we're not re-traumatizing and that it's for a purpose and, and all of that. So um, thank you, Asia, Keegan, Dessa, I think you're still on, you guys did great all the youth um yeah we we can't express our gratitude enough so um oh, wait, I mean, there's actually a question for keegan oh. on in the chat since he's still here um so mary wants to know if you're getting any assistance for college programs you want or funding um she says i hope so you're very articulate um funny thing no um when you're saying college programs i mean the most that i uh, and receiving assistant wise is um, the student loans that I'll, I'll eventually have to pay back. And then my school has a, uh, has like a bonus scholarship that they give. But aside from that, um, with the degree I'm going into, and I, I think uh, Asia mentioned it perfectly earlier, you know, while I was going through my, my, uh, my time uh, as a quote delinquent, um, I ended up missing a substantial amount of school which after that point, I worked my butt off and got like 4.0s the next four semesters, and I still didn't make a 3.0. So I, I, didn't, I didn't actually um, qualify for the majority of scholarships um, that I applied for or anything financial assistance that way. So I think, I think that if I would have, I mean, obviously, if I wouldn't have, you know, been messing around and making bad decisions as a youth, it would have been a different story financially. But um, one of the 
interesting things. There's really not a whole lot, um, at least for my, not my demographic, but for my specific area um, to get uh, financial assistance. I don't know if that answers your question because I'm not 100% sure about what all the programs would be, but I do yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, I know in Nebraska, Keegan, there are some, they call it, I think it's the Bridge to Independence program. So there, there's different funding mechanisms that might be available for formerly involved system youth. And so I'm not sure what South Dakota has to offer or if there was any of those opportunities for for you, um, for your further education. Um, from, my, from my understanding, and I mean, Annie might be able to correct me on this, but I have, I don't think we have anything like that in South Dakota. I, and if we do, I, I think it requires me to stay in South Dakota. And for the degree that I'm pursuing of psychology, it's just more beneficial in other more progressive educational states. So that's kind of, I, I don't know, that's very awesome Nebraska does that. So. Well, and Mary chats in here. She says, if you're ever in foster care, you can access the ETV funds. Um. Mary, I'm not sure if you are able to unmute, if you could share with us. I'm not sure what ETV funds represent or stand for. Sure. Hi, Keegan. Um, I've worked with the Independent Living Program years before at the state and federal level. And the educational training voucher dollars, if you've ever been in the foster care system, um, no, just in the juvenile delinquent, juvenile justice system, okay, um, then you would be eligible for some dollars. But I don't know where you're located in South Dakota, but I would definitely reach out to anybody that you can within your educational programs just to really talk through and go through all of the different funding opportunities because even if it has to do with um, just your area of interest or a grandparent or a parent, or if you're a first time uh, college student, if your parents didn't go to college, you have access to some of those dollars. So, you know, Pell Grant money, I'm just not sure what you're getting, but I just really wanted to reach out and encourage you um, because education really is gonna be the key and you have so much to offer. So. I uh, look forward to hearing from you and whatever profession you go into in the future. So I just wanted to encourage you to keep it up. I appreciate that very much, actually. So thank you. You bet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mary. All right, Annie, I think we, we've we uh, wrapped up with everything here. Um, any parting words, Asia or Keegan, to add? Um, I don't have any. Just want to say thank you, everyone, for participating and hearing us out. Um, and like I said, thank you, Annie, again for having me. Um, I look forward to the next time. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Asia. You did great. You you really do. You've got like this natural ability to just like elicit these <laughs> uh, responses from from kids. So um, that's awesome. Keep it up. You're thank you. amazing, Asia. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, and yes, thanks everyone for joining. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a good one guys.